patented it. I patented it back in 2004, which means it's about to expire. But um, uh, in all that time, I talked to industry a little bit, and they they were a little bit interested, but they they, they wanted to see a demonstration. They wanted us to run our algorithm on their problem. So I want to talk a little bit about that story because we're right in the middle of it, um, and I think a lot of people here can relate to it. Um, uh, so I, I, I think based on what we saw, Tom Kelly's uh, uh, presentation, it was uh, a lot of perspective from industry. Um, and so maybe I'll balance it out with a little bit of perspective from academics. But, but at the same time, we are going out to industry. As a matter of fact, we were just at FabTech, um, where we saw a lot of the, the, the 3D printing vendors were there down in Chicago. That was, uh, and that was the most exciting part, I'd say, of the whole conference, uh, was the 3D section. Um, all right, so, and, and we, we got started on this academic, I mean, the uh, industrialization of this, the commercialization of the research um, uh, back in, well, I think it was about two years ago, or actually, I guess, um, that was about two years ago, summer of 2021, um, with this m -Track program came along. So this is a funding program from the state of Michigan uh, to commercialize. It stands for Michigan Translational Research and Commercialization. Um, and this is, the Act Center is uh, Advanced Computing Technologies, okay? That's run out of um, uh, 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 Wayne State University. So we heard about that, and um, that, that was available with funding up to, I think, uh, what's it, $100,000 uh, one year, and the idea was to Get, help academic results get out to industry by, by uh, doing a lot of customer discovery, a lot of going out to industry, talking to people out there uh, in industry. And um, I feel like my voice might be starting to fade because I've been talking all week. But, um, uh, and so we applied. And this is our final application. We, we, uh, it's, it's, you basically have to go through a two-step process. You, get, um, you make it through the first round, and then you have to give a... Uh, Kind of a project pitch, so it's I think about uh, I think it was like ten minutes to a an oversight committee, and these are all uh, tech investors basically, um, not academics, and they wanted a short speech. So I thought I'd start out with that slideshow. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to pitch it in ten minutes. I'm not gonna worry about the time like I had to there. That was a pretty high pressure situation. So this is a pitch of what we're doing. I wanted to give an overview up front anyway. So this is just an overall view of our algorithm and the problem it's, we think it, it might be able to solve in industry. And this is a problem that, um, or this is a presentation that's meant to be non-technical. It doesn't go into the details of how the algorithm works. But I will go into a little bit more detail on that after this, so this overview. Um, all right, so this, this was our team back then. And remember, Northern Michigan University is not an engineering school. We have an engineering technology uh, uh, school, basically. Um, uh, and so I reached out to uh, uh, Cal Folkinghorn uh, to be on our team because you know this MTrack program is used to uh, uh, basically uh, tier one research universities applying. And so teams, I was told, are typically made up of uh, postdocs, doctoral students, uh, and maybe several faculty. So our team was just me. And um, our brand new master's degree program, we're primarily an undergraduate institution, but we had a brand new master's program in computer science that year. And these are the first students. And I grabbed every one of them. And I said, uh, you're going to work on this project? And, uh, and they said, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, and they're all gone. They've all left the project uh, because they had, uh, they, they had other things they ended up discovering they wanted to do. So I've got a, a new team. But, I want to emphasize that you know you really have to have graduate students to be able to staff uh, these kinds of projects um, that have the right level of expertise and pay level. So um, uh, and I, I, it was fortuitous that you know we have to start our master's program in computer science uh, just in time for this. All right, so um, that that's our team, and this is the problem we're trying to address. So just imagine you have a, a substrate. Material kind of expensive, maybe. We were talking about, uh, I think Tom was talking about, was it Tom Kelly? Who was that? Mm -hmm. um, who was talking about, you know, sheets, sheet metal, um, the traditional kinds of fabrication when you're cutting that sheet metal or uh, steel, aluminum. Um, some of that's pretty expensive. Stainless steel, um, titanium, of course, very expensive. And uh, you're trying to cut your shapes out of there, and then later you might form them, press them, and uh, bend them into 3D. 
but it's a two-dimensional problem. And your substrate shape, which isn't always rectangular, it could be a remnant that you're cutting, you want to maximize usage of that. So you want to cut the most pieces out. So imagine we're cutting a single, uh, single piece nesting. So we want to find out what's the maximum number of pieces we can cut out of that material, the remaining material being wasted. You know, it has to be maybe melted down again, reformed. Sometimes it's, it's often just thrown away. So we want to minimize the waste, maximize the utilization rate. So, uh, so utilization for, uh, rate plus waste rate is 100%. Um, all right, so, uh, and there are companies out there doing it. This is an interesting one because uh, I took some, took some screenshots of their video. But um, uh, they're trying to do this for you in the cloud. And I like that idea of doing it in the cloud so that we don't have to make our own software package and support it. We don't have to put hardware and software together uh, and sell those. So this is just something we had in mind at the time. You upload your shape nesting problem to our server, and it sends you back a, a really good nesting. Um, let's see. So, so this is a problem that's pretty general. It's, uh, we just recently found out, yesterday, we were doing an interview, right? And we found out that uh, they would do this, they need to do this with cakes. Um, there's some big, big companies that basically are cutting out, you know, little snack cakes. And they're cutting them out of a big sheet. Okay, but I don't know they should find out. Giant sheet cakes, they said. They freeze them and then they cut them with water jets. And they try to nest as many of the, what do they say, Christmas trees and things like that. Um, we, were, we were quite surprised by that. So we're usually thinking of steel, uh, leather, cutting leather uh, parts out. Um, oh, the animation is actually running. Isn't that nice? Uh, we had problems with that. The the, uh, so, this is an example where we ran our algorithm. Oh, this is our algorithm on the, on the right side here uh, using an evolutionary algorithm uh, to evolve a solution. And then on the left side, we have a demo package from an industry uh, product, uh, Archive Insignia. Um, and we ran, and this is years ago, we ran this uh, experiment. So we have a very simple part, which is just a disk. And uh, uh, but the substrate's kind of complicated. It's a non-convex polygon. And um, most of the software packages uh, can, all, can fit 10 or 11 disks on there. And ours fit 12. So that's, we had to hunt around for an example where we beat, you know, industry software packages. But we, we found one. And, um, and that can make a difference, right? If you're trying to get as many, uh, you know, get the, as much utilization out as possible. But I want you to pay attention to what, how this is working. All the packages that I've seen, nobody, nobody tells us the exact algorithm that they're using, but if you look at the, the, the left side, I, I mean, our Kevin Signe asked you which corner you want to start the nest in, right? And um, so did that other package we were looking at the other day um, from, uh, is that control automation? They also ask you which of the four corners you want to start in. So they assume some bounding rectangle and you, know, you, you start in one of the four corners. Um, and you can do the runs. Uh, from all four corners, and you, you nest in a particular direction, usually vertical or, or horizontal. And um, so that those eight combinations, you try them all, and you know, and you go with the best one, right? So, uh, but they're all doing this kind of sequential nesting. And in sequential nesting, uh, you have an issue where, you know, that maybe that early placement of a disk is is, is fixed, and maybe it ends up, you know, pre uh, precluding a better solution later on. You can't go back. Uh, and undo that decision. As far as I know, none of them have backtracking. Uh, well, I think some of them do, but then you have to let the nesting run for a long time. And if there's one thing we've learned from our, our industry interviews so far, they, their users are amazingly impatient for these runs because as computer scientists, we say, well, they'll run overnight. You know, if we get, a, we get uh, one more disk on there, that's worth it. We can publish a paper. But um, most of the, we were surprised, I, I was surprised asking a lot of these users, and we've done about, what about 35, 36 interviews so far. Um, most of them say, yeah, I can, I can afford to wait maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Um, if it's a complicated nest, if there are a lot of parts, we'll wait, we'll wait a minute. And that's, that's about it for most of them. And, and that's, that's a fairly short amount of time. Especially when you ask them what kind of machine they're running on, and they will tell you, um, like a, well, it's usually not, Windows 98. It's usually an old Windows machine, right? And uh, and they're you know four core quad core machine at best. So um, uh, they they just need decisions very quickly. Uh, 
So, uh, ours is a massively parallel approach in which we start out with uh, literally, um, well, right now we're doing tens of thousands of possible placements at once. Um, once we port this to a GPU, we're planning to try hundreds of thousands or millions of placements all at once. So a population of, with millions of different possibilities all being considered at the same time. Uh, and then what you're looking for is the, what we're looking for, what we're evolving for, um, is the largest set of non-competing elements. By competing, we mean they overlap, right? So we're looking for the largest set of non-overlapping elements. That's the selective pressure. So that's a parallel approach. And it's, it's, a, it's very different from anything we've seen out in industry, uh, 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 nesting algorithms out there so far. Um, all right, so uh, just to give you another example of, of why it's different, and we're calling it deep scale evolution because not just because deep is a good buzzword these days, and it is, I admit that, but also because I at least think there's something deep about it. I know we had that long conversation in the car in which I failed to convey my uh, what I mean by that, but um, I think there there's a there's a depth in what's going on that's akin to what what's going on with deep learning where you basically have different levels of abstraction of, of, of what you're trying to evolve, all interacting at the same time. Because, uh, well, I'll try to explain that later. Since uh, I don't have much faith, I'll be able to convey that. Um, uh, but here is what uh, an interesting experiment where we took Arcan insignias, eight different results. So remember I said you could start in four different corners, start the nesting, and you could go in from there primarily horizontally or primarily vertical, you know, and so you have those, that's an eight, eight combinations, and you get eight different nesting runs with eight different results. All of them on this problem produced 11 disks in the final nesting, I'm sorry, was it 11? Yeah, it was 11 disks. And then, um, so that's a total of 88 different um, disks. We took all 88 and we, we put it in a single population in our uh, deep scale evolution algorithm. Um, and just ran selection on that. So this is just 88 instead of, you know, we might generate millions, uh, hopefully, when we're running on GPU. But typically, we have uh, tens of thousands. Here, we just have 88. And selection actually picked out these 12. So the solution, the superior solution of 12 disks was in Arcan Insignia's runs, but it, the algorithm didn't, lacked any way to pull those 12 out of the 88, right? So. This is just a, you know, problem side of this problem is uh, 88 choose 12, right? That's still a pretty big number. Um, but that's what the, the selection in the algorithm is, is looking for. So um, so that means, uh, that kind of suggests maybe the algorithm is good as a packet to some of the existing industry software that's out there. I don't know, but uh, we're open to all those possibilities. So uh, these are some of the other, the slightly different Polygon here, the exterior polygon, you might notice the uh, substrate's a slightly different shape. Uh, I think that was just because I, uh, got some, I typed in some of the numbers wrong. But for all of these different runs on these different demo packages, uh, it's all the same shape. And so uh, Pronest got 11, well, Optinus got 11 disks. Um, Pronest initially got 10 disks. And then I, I tried to learn something about uh, 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 the, the software package because of a bunch of parameters to tune, and uh, so I spent about 30 minutes playing around with them because I, you know, I, uh, I was new to the package. So maybe somebody spends months or years using Pronest might be even better. But then I got 11 disks. Arcan Insignia, 11 disks. So, um, and again, DSC 12 disks on this particular problem. So it's, you know, if you're nesting disks. You don't need to rotate. You don't have to worry about rotating. So that makes it an easier problem. So, oh yeah, we're, we're supposed to come up with a killer experiment for our Amtrak contract here. If you've got the money, we're supposed to prove that, uh, you know, what what would be... Uh, I, 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 I mean, I should emphasize, this wasn't just commercialization. This is actually involves additional research and additional development of the algorithm. It's just the idea is, it would be informed by all our customer interviews and all our you know, information gatherings would be focused on solving real problems out there in the industry. And how would we know when we're going to, you know, whether we should proceed or not 
Well, we had to come up with some numbers. So I'm not going to dwell on that, but because um, uh, we're still working on that project. Um, they wanted to know, yeah, so approach to market. Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. A lot of this, there, we found out there's a lot of nesting software out there, mostly mostly written by the, the vendors of the big cutting machines, the big plasma jet cutters and laser cutters. Um, they write their own nesting software that works with their their cutting machines. Um, so we could maybe license the software them, license the algorithm. Um, we could try to make our own standalone package. Uh, I don't know, that sounds a lot like the most work to me. Um, or the, I'm not, I don't know how to make a user interface. But um, uh, I like the idea of a cloud service, but that relies on people willing to up, take the time to upload their problem to the cloud and wait for it and come back. But then we could run our own GPU server because this is evolution, so it's naturally parallel. It's just like neural networks, you know. It's naturally it's easy to port it to the GPU. Um, and uh, we, you know, we've got, we could use the Amtrak contract to buy any hardware, unfortunately. So it's based mostly just for salaries and travel. But, um, but we, we, uh, we already had uh, a PC with a couple of GPUs in there for neural for deep learning for teaching and researching deep learning with uh, our students. So we took it over for the project, um, and this and it's got what? Those are Nvidia GTX seven. I forgot what they are. They they have 3,500 uh, uh, GPU cores, CUDA cores each. Two of them. That's seven seven thousand CUDA cores. And the way artificial evolution works is just. I said naturally parallel, so we can basically evaluate every disk, uh, every piece placement, us uh, independently of the other, so in parallel. So we should get a speed up on the order of you know close to seven thousand times. So I, 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 we don't know; we haven't finished that porting yet. So this this overhead and things like that. But still, thousands of times faster. Our software you've seen the results of so far. That software is all single threaded, single threaded. So it's really you know. Um, it's, kind of, it's going around to each of the, the uh, those pieces, each of those disks, calculating its uh, fitness, and then doing a global selection process. So, um, yeah, we should get a huge speed up. But we also bought time. We reserved some time on the GPU cloud. Actually, not Google. So, uh, we got Amazon. But the point is, you can buy a little bit of time, let's say a few minutes of time, um, for basically a few dollars. And you can run it, and I'm not sure because we haven't done this yet, but um, you can run it on, you know, 100,000 cores or more. And I'd be curious, you know, uh, just, just how fast we get this to run and how big a population size. The bigger the population size, the more placements we can consider simultaneously. Right? So uh, anyway, uh, and there's also the possibility of doing 3D nesting because there's nothing inherently 2D about what we're doing, about the algorithm. It's just looking for whether or not these two species are, are competing. In other words, overlapping. But the overlap could be in any number of dimensions. And uh, so, but our, our funding right now is, is focused on 2D. And there's, there's enough of that. But yeah, like I said, we went to the 3D printing section of M-Track. I mean, of uh, M, uh, Fabtech. Um, which I think is the largest, it's probably the largest manufacturing trade show in the, in the world, at least in this country. That was amazing. And, and the, the 3D section was relatively small compared to the, all the, the, the 2D uh, vendors. Um, but they were, uh, they were up and coming. And, and like Tom was, I, I caught Tom saying that it's, you know, that they, they view it as they're going to take over. It's just a matter of, there's, an in, there's a lot of inertia. You know, the industry, the manufacturing industry is focused on, on 2D, and so it's taken a while. There's a natural, you know, prejudice, if you will. But um, uh, but we did talk to some of those 3D printer manufacturers, and they were talking about doing large production runs where they do lots of different pieces all at once, and they have to nest those pieces onto the print table. And, and so, the, you know, and that's, a, and so that's a, a challenge they're dealing with. So. And we said we could help with that. That's actually 2D nesting. But if you're talking about printing with the support structure, you can print in 3D. And you could have uh, parts printing on top of each other with the support structure that breaks away. And so, you know, that's a 3D volume nesting problem. Uh, anyway, so um, these are all to 
with MTRAC and with i you really have to NSBIR uh, or National Science Foundation. Those, they're all looking for, what do they say, paradigm shifting, or potentially paradigm shifting, potentially groundbreaking, you know, technologies that might change the way we do things. Um, so, uh, threw that stuff in there about three years. Uh, let's see. Right, so this is just a summary of how we compare with the, you know, um, and this again is talking to te uh, board of tech, uh, tech investors. So they want to know things about budget for, our, yeah, this is interesting. We asked for $75,000 total and they, uh, and they came back and, and um, gave us more. They said, we think you can do, if we give you another $20,000 more or so, you know, um, would you like another $20,000? And, and I said, sure. And then they said, well, what would you do with it? And, uh, I was on the spot because they, I was expecting a call that would say, you know, yes, you want it or no, you didn't. But instead they say, well, you know, we think you, you, you can get, you can do more with us, with more money. Uh, and I said, okay, yeah, I think so too. I agree with that. And they said, well, what would you do with it? Uh, uh, pay the students more? Um, uh, I was careful not to say do more research. I mean, they don't want you to do too much fundamental research. But, um, it turns out what they really wanted me to say was they wanted me to say that uh, I would go out and find a lead customer, a, lead, a leading user, an early adopter, and we would spend the money building a prototype with them, or maybe visiting them a lot, and you know, with, uh, um, really working with them, and maybe paying them or something like that to, to work with us. Um, they, 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 I like the idea of a lead, a lead uh, uh, you know, during your interviews, finding you know, uh, uh, somebody who gets excited and wants to work with you. Uh, let's see. Ah, this is just a timeline. I hate looking at timelines. Um, and then the summary. So, uh, and again, this is the this is a project pitch. I mean, this is like a you know like a, a it's a pitch deck, I guess they call it. I watched a lot of YouTube videos about this stuff. Um, so, um, that's the business side. I um, thought maybe I'd just give you a little bit of a background on the. Hang on a second. Not used to doing the presentations in extended desktop mode. <coughs> Let me see if this other one has stayed up. So I want to go back to a different talk that I, this is a talk that I made, I gave, if I can find it, to the Coin Lab at Michigan State University a few years ago. And a good friend of mine, Kalyan Moidev, uh, from back in graduate student days, he's down there now. And he invited me down a few years back, uh, before COVID, uh, down to Michigan State to talk to his, to give a talk to his students about the um, his graduate students. So, um, and so let me let me uh, run that. And the, the focus was a little bit different. So, but I will edit it as I go. Just talk about what I think is the important part of the history here. Okay. So, oh, it was 2017, that long ago. Wow. Okay, so, uh, but I wanted to introduce that term, richness, uh, which in biology is the number of species present in an ecosystem. Uh, so, so we are, you know, we want a rich, um, we, we want a lot of species because that represents, you know, the ones who can fit um, on the substrate surface. And we want more of them, but we also want to, we also want selection to drive towards the sort of minimum richness because we want only we only selective only the species who cooperate or don't compete at least with the other species. So it's an interesting. You know, trying to relate this work to the um, biology biologists often don't like us computer scientists thinking that we can model nature. Um, but, uh, okay, so just to remind you, the basic simple genetic algorithm, um, and that's an old term, uh, it's not as politically correct now as evolutionary computation, just in terms of the politics of our field. Uh, a more, more umbrella term is evolutionary computation, but the idea is artificial evolution. And for a long time we've been doing basically the simple GA, which is where you um, basically take a, um, a population, usually randomly generated at first, of possible solutions to a problem. And each member of the population is a complete solution to the problem. Okay? Um, and 
it's usually, you know, if you randomly generate a solution, it's probably not a good one. So we have some kind of figure of merit, and we try to improve on that. So we have a way of, uh, um, and the graduate students who are here just recently took a course with me last winter semester and uh, on evolutionary computation, and we, um, we worked on the New York City Tunnels problem. Actually, I think that's in here, so I'll talk about that. Um, so, and, and the figure of merit for the New York City Tunnels problem is, um, I mean, the problem is to come up with a, with a pipe network that supplies fresh water to New York, actually, uh, so an, an improvement to the pipe network, uh, to the pipe network that's, uh, that's already there. You, you can basically duplicate some of the pipes and put in some parallel pipes. And you want to do so with, uh, to meet the new pressure requirements, usually dictated by firefighting requirements. You have to have enough pressure at the hydrant uh, to reach up high enough. Um, and uh, and then minimize the cost. So it's a multi-objective problem. Um, but the figure of merit, the single scale of figure that sort of combines cost and, and um, with penalties for not meeting the minimum pressure requirements. So there's this, there's this idea that this, you're trying to either maximize it or minimize it. Europeans like to minimize functions. We in, in the United States seem to like to maximize them. That's maybe a cultural difference. But, uh, but you just take the inverse and you get the... Uh, uh, you get the, uh, you can flip them. Um, uh, and normally we're trying to just maximize that fitness. So, but here in this algorithm, we're actually, actually oh no, this is still a simple GA. So this is basically uh, uh, how we do selection. You take for an individual X, or in our case a species X, it has some objective fitness, and then you divide it by the average fitness to get some uh, 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 value. You know. Uh, greater than one or less than one, right? If, if, you're, if X's fitness is above the average fitness of the current population, then that fraction is greater than one, and you multiply that by the current proportion of species X, and it grows. So next generation time T plus one, we get more of X if its, if it's current fitness, or, or its objective fitness, is greater than the average fitness. If it's below the average fitness, the, per the proportion shrink, and that's the entire algorithm. Okay, well you can throw in crossover mutation, um, so that you can get some experimentation with some new, you know. But every generation just run that uh, selection. That's the primary, uh, well, it's, it's important to have that selective pressure. Okay, so, um, uh, and that gives you this kind of logistic, um, well, sigmoid growth. Um, okay, but uh, now fitness sharing is something a little different because we're, uh, we're actually allowing the fitness of an individual to depend on other members of the population. So it's a form of co-evolution. And when I was a graduate student, I came to my, my uh, advisor, Dave Goldberg, and I said, I want to do co-evolution. Right? Because I think, you know, this evolving individuals, just according to their, their individual ability to solve a problem, is simple. It's just too simple. I want to, I want to, I want to you know, the real world is we're all co-evolving, right? We're all interacting with each other, and that seems like a very powerful thing. And uh, my advisor, of course, said, yes, but it's very complicated. Um, and, you know, as an academic, we're, as academics, we like to, you know, strip things down to the essentials. So um, once you dive into a, a co-evolution and allowing individuals' fitness to depend on other individuals in the population, you get very complex dynamics often bad dynamics, you get chaos, you get collapse of the population, and things like that. And so, we came up with a compromise, which is what you're supposed to do, right, when you're a graduate advisor and you've got students coming to you, they have their own ideas, um, uh, some of them are crazy, but they're passionate about it, and maybe they're, maybe, you know, they'll eventually, you know, really break through. But, at the same time, you have things you want to do, and so you find some compromise. This was the compromise. Goldberg was already working on fitness sharing with Kalyan, same fellow down at Michigan State, uh, and his, uh, Kalyan's 1989 master's thesis was on this idea of fitness sharing. So your fitness as a species in the population is dependent on how many others there are of you. So if there are a lot of other copies of you, let's say, then uh, you're all competing for the same resource, let's say, um, then your, your fitness is lower. So just imagine a simple example, we're all competing for a, um, a sunlight, we're all competing for this particular chemical that we need in the current environment around us. The more there are of us, the more we have to split up that, that finite amount of resource 
and therefore the maybe the less fit we are, the less offspring we have. So you know, limited growth in other words. You're limited by your resource. Um, it seems like a basic part of biology, right? But we we haven't been doing that much of it in, in um, evolutionary algorithms because it's very hard to control that. It's very hard to understand what's going on. Um, so, uh, but Goldberg adopted that. Um, uh, Goldberg and Richardson actually came up with this idea of a simple way of sort of mirroring that. And then they were able to get this distribution, so um, a distributed population. So rather than converge to a single uniform population of the best species found so far, you converge to uh, the best a set of, of, of very good individuals, but different. And this is an example of, this is way, it's a long time ago. Um, let me give you a more modern example. Okay, well, I should, yeah, this is New York City Tunnels problem, which, um, uh, let's see, who worked on that? Uh, yes, Paul did, and uh, Jordan is here, Jordan Simula, Paul Richter, both worked on that during the, um, that's basically what we did for that whole semester. We worked on this problem, we came up with some new results, and we submitted them to, well, luckily there was a conference in Chicago, uh, the IEEE Conference on Evolutionary Computation. We were able to get down there for the summer and, um, and, and present it, so. Uh, I got COVID, unfortunately, so they presented it. Uh, I literally was up in my room. I could not come down for uh, uh, That's what finally gave me my first case of COVID. And the only case I've had so far was leaving the UP and, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and it was, I was in a really, we were in a really nice hotel, and I was just in bed for the second, the whole second half of the conference. But, uh, but these guys, I, I, they were planning to present without me anyway. I told them they should. And so, um, but I didn't even get a photo of you guys. And you forgot to take a photo of yourself. So. Um, uh, but anyway, so so the New York City tunnels problem um, is, is is well known. It was um, it's, uh, I think the first results were from 1968 or something like that, 1967. Um, Shucky and I uh, first started publishing about this. So this is a simulation, obviously, of, of a very complex real world uh, problem that's now you know many decades out of date. But um, so Shucky and I uh, produced a solution that met all the pressure requirements and was. Uh, that cost like something like sixty something million dollars in nineteen sixty something dollars. So, um, and they did that by hand. These were civil engineers. So this algorithm, uh, this problem comes to us from the civil engineering community. Uh, Angus Simpson and his group down in Australia. Um, uh, Angus Simpson was uh, uh, a, a, a colleague of Dave Goldberg's, and so he came to us on, on sabbatical. And uh, when I was a graduate student at Goldberg's, and they showed us this problem. And we said, well, we applied the genetic algorithm to it, and lo and behold simple GA, but it, it found better solutions. It found about like five better solutions that were all better than the best solution. Um, uh, the best solution at the time I think was what, something like $40 million. And it, over the years they found better and better solutions. So the GA found solutions that were more like, um, this was a, a 38.7 and then there's a 39.2, a 39.2 um, something. And, 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 uh, so let's say all of these five were found they were better than the GA, uh, uh, better than any human had found. So Angus Simpson was very happy with that, but what he was unhappy about was that the really best solution, the best solution, $38.7 million, was only found in about 20, about 30% of the runs. And uh, and these two solutions are very similar. So they're like, you know, they're, they're both uh, they're very similar chromosomes, very similar to, uh, solutions. Uh, and they're hard to find, apparently. And then the, uh, and remember, we're starting out with random initialization of the population. We have random chances of uh, random crossovers, random mutations. And so there's a lot of uh, stochasticity in the prop, in the algorithm. Um, but, they, they, and they wonder how can we make them um, more likely to be found? And so Goldberg suggested fitness sharing to spread the population out. And, uh, and he suggested that, I, well, nobody else in the, in the and our group really wanted to work on this because they had they had an old what was it it was a Pascal code and it was, uh, it was Turbo Pascal and it was um, it was not modular I mean they weren't computer scientists they were graduate students in civil engineering so it's like one block three thousand lines of code and it was very very delicate if you um, it would it would break all the time if you change something uh, so we had translated in the, uh, well actually I just my, I just wrote my genetic algorithm in Pascal. But later, some uh, a, a new student translated to C, so we have a C version of their black box. Uh, uh, it's a pipe network simulator, and you know it involves a lot of um, complex water dynamic uh, 
hydrodynamics, so civil engineer's code. Um, anyway, all right, so we applied our genetic algorithm with some fitness sharing, and we improved um, the probability, in other words, the number of random runs that, that would find the optimal solution to about 80%. And we, we, we did further studies of that uh, this past semester, winter semester, and we, we uh, duplicated basically those results and got further details. Anyway, point is, the really exciting part is that with niching, we're calling it niching now, with, with, with the fitness sharing, not only did we increase the chances of finding that solution and that solution, and all the solutions, we increase the chance of finding them. But we found you find all of them together in one run. They're all found there. The, 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 the population is distributed out over all of the best solutions at the same time. So that makes, what, what, that, what that's telling you is that, you know, you can have a population that rather than converging on a uniform population of the entire, of just the best solution, it actually can, you can find lots of diverse solutions all at the same time. And that, that's helping the search. At least that's a hypothesis, right? It's helping the search, that diversity. Um, okay, so that was actually a long time ago. Let me just um, mention that. Uh, then, then along came multi-objective in the early 90s, where we, uh, I was still a graduate student. I was working with uh, Nick, Nick and Anakmi Olders and I were taking a class on multi-objective decision-making because it, it just, uh, we had to take classes, right? Uh, graduate level classes. And this was from Deborah Thurston. She had a class on this. Because I had been bugging Dave Goldberg about it. I said, I, I don't understand how, how people solve. I mean, if you have two objectives, let's say you're trying to reduce cost and improve quality, there are conflicting objectives, right? How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and it turns out, it's really hard, right? So there's a whole multi-criteria decision-making community. And that's what Deb Thurston was teaching that semester. And she said, OK, well, you can. Uh, um, Basically, you try to model a decision maker's fundamental trade-off between, you know, two conflicting objectives, um, and uh, so we spent a whole semester on that. And then we had to do a, a project or take the final exam. So Nick and I said, well, let's let's apply a genetic algorithm to this, and, and we'll do that as a project. Um, so uh, what we looked at was, let's say these are the two objectives you're trying to you're trying to maximize this objective, and you're trying to minimize this objective, right? So. Um, so all of these are solutions that have a trade-off. So there are this trade-off curve, um, what we call the non-dominated set or the Pareto optimal set. Um, and uh, like, for example, this solution dominates these solutions back here because it's it has higher quality and lower cost. So you know we don't really we're not interested in these solutions back here. But these solutions, like this one here, has a higher quality than than these here and a lower cost than those there, so, uh, but, but not both. So they are a set of non-dominated solutions. So you can apply a selective pressure here. You can, like if you compare two individuals, if one dominates the other, it beats it. Um, if, uh, if, they, if neither one dominates the other, then you, you, you just, they're tied and you select both. So we applied that basic selection idea, and we got this Pareto optimal set, except it was kind of clumped in one place. So then we said, oh, we need some kind of fitness sharing to spread it out. So we combined the fitness sharing, and we got a nice spread. And, uh, and that was a good paper. And then we found out that at the end that summer, there was a conference. So this is a, this is a real world multi-objective problem. And that's the initial population. And this is the final population. And we got this nice distribution over a trade-off surface here. Um, and we found out that a bunch of people were going to be publishing um, multi-objective genetic algorithm paper as well. One for the sake of climbing we're going to. So Nick and I hurried up and, and took our class project, which wasn't that well written, rewrote it as a technical report. There wasn't enough time to get it into the conference proceedings. But we were hosting the conference that summer. Goldman was hosting the conference. So we just produced massive amounts of copies of the technical report. Back in those days, it was hard copies. And we just, all day long, we had our undergraduate assistants just bringing them over to the conference. And we distributed them like crazy. So now we're known as uh, contemporaries in terms of, uh, for the sake of Fleming, in terms of being the early pioneers of the multi-objective genetic algorithm, which is a huge area. Now, Deb Kalyan, who was at, this, at that time in India, he had a master's student working on his the first master's degree well, multi-objective genetic algorithms. Um, he's now Michigan State. He said that's all he's going to do is multi-objective. He wrote the first textbook on it. Anyway, um, so multi-objective is just a great example of, of um, fitness sharing, a uh, co-evolution being used to uh, solve a hard problem. 
Uh, and without the sharing, it's, 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 it's shown that, you know, you will just get a portion of the trade off the whole front, we'll get that nice spread, so it's become integral. Um, that's, I want to go beyond that, though. So, actually, uh, uh, okay, so let me just mention, let's skip ahead to this. So, I was having an in interesting conversation with Dave Goldberg about the trade off the whole front, and I was saying, well, you know, the distributions look kind of clumpy, like there's, I mean, spread out, but there's a clump here, a clump there, a clump there, kind of almost evenly spaced. And Goldberg said, um, that's interesting, you know, because the Pareto optimal set is a flat fitness function, right? Everybody in there has the same fitness, right? They're all equal because everybody outside of it, you know, they're dominated, so they have lower fitness. But by your selection method, um, they all have, in, in the Pareto optimal set, it's an equivalence class, right? Everybody has the same fitness. So then you're just, you're, you're, when you're doing the niching, uh, all you're doing is, trying to spread them out. So you're saying, okay, well, you're degrading their fitness according to how many neighbors they have close to them. So you're trying to spread them out. So what does fitness sharing look like on a flat fitness function? So you said, go look at that. And that was a great idea. So I said, okay, here's a flat fitness function in one dimension, right? So the fitness, um, superimposed here, the fitness is one uh, uh, in between, uh, what is it, I don't know, I forgot, 40 and, and 200 and something. Um, it's one. And then outside of that, it's zero. And the initial population, of course, is you know, randomly distributed. Uh, but you can see the fitness, objective fitness out here is zero. So now we run this fitness, and the, so the, the ones with zero fitness die off right away. Uh, but the ones uh, of a fitness of one, objective fitness, they're going to they're gonna all have the same objective fitness, but their shared fitness, which is used in selection, is going to depend on the, their neighbors, how, many, you know, how crowded they are. And you get this interesting edge effect. So initially, um, these guys on the edge, they shoot up in terms of the proportion of the population because they don't have any competition to the left and right, to the, uh, I mean to their right, because they're on the edge. Uh, the individuals um, uh, on one side of them have all died off because they're, they're you know, they have fit in zero. So, but, but gradually, as those edge individuals, the species, grow in proportion, they tend to wipe out the individuals next to them, because again, you have that, you know, um, uh, I should say the the, ra the radius of fitness sharing is, I think, here about 20? I forgot, but, you know, it's such that every 20, so these are non-overlapping, in other words. They are, they're, they're, they occupy niches that are non-overlapping. And if that, if the niche radius um, is, well, let's put it this way, if the width of the substrate for this hat function is a, is a multiple, of the niche radius, you get this kind of exact fit of these species. And when you have an exact fit, it wipes out every other species. So you get this perfect, perfect distribution. So I was intrigued by that. I said, well, does it work in two dimensions? And um, let me see. So here we, let's say we're, uh, our, uh, we have these squares. And if they have an overlap, that's their area of overlap. And that's the more, the bigger that area of overlap, the closer they are and the more they compete with each other. And so plugging that in, and this is just one dimensional, um, I don't remember this for uh, we, we end up with a, okay, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, if that width of this substrate one dimension is an exact multiple of the, the, uh, the, the, the width of a square, then we get all the other species being wiped out. And we just get this perfect, you know, fit. And then in two dimensions, we truly have two dimensions, we get the same kind of thing. So there's a four by four substrate, and each unit square, we fit 16 of them on there exactly. That's not very realistic out in the real world of shape testing, but, but in this ideal situation, I'll take show for a while, but um, you'll end up with an exact, uh, the, the entire species, the entire population will converge to those 16. Um, so that, you know, and again, this is a dynamic equilibrium. It's a, um, it's just amazing to see to me that, you know, the whole population is converging, not to a single solution, but to a population whose distribution represents a single solution to the problem, represents the best solution. So we're not evolving solutions to the problem. We're evolving pieces of solutions to the problem that together solve the problem, so the population Problem. That seems to be more like, you know, that's more powerful in some way. Well, it's very different. Anyway, all right, so, patented that. Um, 
And then um, we, we started applying some more complex uh, shapes. And again, uh, so this is, there's no exact cover here. So in reality, what you end up getting is, you know, the, you, can't, you just can't cover all this. But uh, you have to, uh, you get a population that includes not only the best, maybe, uh, subset, but also a lot of the other species too, but at lower proportions. So you've got to have some kind of extraction algorithm um, to pull out the best ones. Um, and uh, but so this is with the extraction algorithm uh, running. Uh, okay, so then we started. So very simply, you know, if you can rotate the parts, so you, your chromosome is basically the x y location of the centroid of the piece, and then your a, a rotation angle. Okay, and that's your those are your chromosomes, and um, uh, and then your let's see, yeah, uh, let's see a real world example. Oh yeah, we, we, we left behind the prop, we left the prop in the car. So, uh, yeah, we had a, I like to hold up this piece of wood I found, literally in the, behind the, yeah, um, it's in the car. But uh, uh, just a piece of wood I found that had been laser cut. Uh, they had cut out five of these pieces, and um, they were all like uh, 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 arranged in kind of a, a nice grid. But, obviously you could fit more on there. So I ran, we ran this through our algorithm, and um, you see a bit of overlap here, but that's a, that's as a result of, we were in such a rush to run this, I was in such a rush to run this that I, I just did uh, an approximation uh, for calculating areas of overlap, um, it's just a sampling of points, and um, it, it uh, that is outside that sample, so the, the algorithm doesn't even know that they're overlapping, so um, if you increase the resolution of the sampling, you can, you know, and there's, there are, there are very fast algorithms for calculating the exact area of overlap polygons, but I hadn't implemented it yet. Um, I was just in a rush to see, uh, yeah, and it actually involved eight, and there was one run we did where it involved nine. We fit nine on there, uh, just barely. Um, so, um, that, that's with rotation. Maybe the person who actually did the original cuts didn't want rotations. They wanted the grain of the wood to be the same uh, in all the pieces, I don't know. Uh, there's another run, just to show some intermediate positions. Okay, so, that's the idea. I want to finish up now. So I just wanted to say, I think uh, we were talking about this one, right? These ones. So all these runs, though, are for the cookie cutter version of shape nesting. That is, um, or what some people call it, we found out that there, there was somebody at Fabtech, I think it was Stella, Stella Source or something like that. They had a booth there, and they were showing off their nesting software, and they said it was, it was limited to, um, what, they, what do they call single, oh, same piece nesting. So you have one shape, and that's all you nest. In, in the academic literature, apparently it's called the cookie cutter problem. It's, you, know, you just have one cookie shape and you want to cut as many of them out from a sheet of dough as you can. Um, and so we've always been calling it the cookie cutter problem. But I think the single single piece problem sounds better. But that's all they had, and they were actually uh, promoting their, uh, their algorithm. See, I don't think our algorithm is going to be general enough until we can handle multiple different pieces at different shapes at the same time. But they were already out there. and. Uh, yeah, so we call it a cookie cutter problem. And, and that's why it was interesting to find out that there actually is apparently a shape cutting, a cake cutting problem. That's actually, <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I talked about that problem. Okay, I'm almost there. Oh, one last thing I want to mention. This is what happens when you're an academic. So um, for many years, I, I, I saw that, that I like the exact, exact cover results where you're, you, know, you have exact <coughs> nesting cover completely every bit, of the, it's impossible to cover every bit of the substrate, right? And then, it appears to, uh, that that solution completely takes over the population, all the other species that don't fit in there, they're all wiped out. And so I, the cleanliness of that, I really love that. So I went to explore that. Um, there, uh, we got some, I got some theoretical results that show that that's gonna happen, uh, uh, well, let me put it this way. The equilibrium, um, the equilibrium solution but we'll leave with that. The exact cover solution is always going to be um, uh, a solution to the, uh, um, the set of linear equations that you get when you, uh, when you model the uh, uh, selection method. Um, and sometimes it's the only solution, but um, if the matrix is what degenerate, then you can have other solutions. And so you don't always get the, uh, but anyway, but uh, so we got some theoretical results. And then I thought, well, you know, Sudoku is an exact cover problem. So uh, can this algorithm solve Sudoku? And lo and behold, it does. So the resources that are covering here are normally allowed one, num number, uh, one numeral per 
each of these 81 cells, you're exactly, you're, you, you're allowed to put exactly, you have to put one through nine in, in each row, exactly one of uh, one through nine in each column, and one of nine in each region. So those are four resources. So a numeral, like let's say eight right here, would uh, would get uh, would it would it would get a little bit of each of these um, resources. Well, let's say let's say an eight here and an eight here, they would conflict because they would be they would they would both be taking care of an eight in this row and in this cell, right? But they're not in the same column, so they don't completely overlap. But okay, so if you follow that, if you plug that um, mapping in, uh, yeah, you do solve Sudoku problems. Just like that, and uh, let's see. So, exact cover, of course, is can be complete. Um, and so we ran this into a, through a um, bunch of puzzles that were in. I just bought a book, a book of puzzles, USA Today, and it turned out that it solved. Uh, oh, by the way, this is what it looks like. If you if you look at the the initial, uh, what happens? This is the initial proportion of each of the possible numeral places. Um, and uh, that, so they all start out with the same equal proportion. And if you watch the, the proportions over time, here's your solution. The solution is Sudoku puzzle, and here are all the others, and they're heading down eventually, uh, well, asymptotically to zero. Um, here's a case where we don't solve uh, the, the puzzle. But if you look at the, the book, um, so most of all of the easy and medium problems are solved. We just took this from a USA Today book. Um, and a bunch of, uh, most of them from the hard uh, class are solved, but not all. Um, it, it just converges to some um, uh, population that doesn't, you know. Um, so, let's see, the total results. All right, now I won't go, I did more, more work on that later. So I spent years working on so applying this algorithm to Sudoku. And publishing this in conferences, you get you get interested in it because everybody knows Sudoku and everybody plays Sudoku. Um, but you know, I found out <laughs> um, no uh, people don't always take it that seriously. We are solving Sudoku, so we went to larger Sudoku problems. And if you look, I, we eventually solved uh, 16 by 16, 25 by 25, 36 by 36, and 48 by 48. And then at that point, I was running out of comp computer power for a single-threaded algorithm. Um, I'd like to go back to that, but again. Now um, we're looking at applying this to real world manufacturing problems. That's where I think, you know. Um, so, anyway, I just wanted to mention it's a, for exact cover, we get much better. It's, it's, we, we get, well, more often we get optimal um, results. All right, so that's it. I did want to mention. So, so, where we are is we are right now, we've got this I4 commercialization grant. The Amtrak grant we, we basically finished up. Um, but, uh, the i -Corp commercialization grant is meant to we have to do 100 interviews okay, of manufacturers, um, and we're, we're just listening. We're just asking about, do you do shit nesting? If you do, how do you do it? A lot of people just do it by hand. A lot of people have automated shit nesters, but they then tweak the results by hand sometimes. Well, when do they do that? Um, uh, how much utilization can you get? That sort of thing. That's what we, we want to ask. So, this is a manufacturing day. If there are manufacturers here, or people associated with manufacturing, like Tom, I'd like to talk to Tom. Um, we would like to talk with you. If we do talk with you, even for a few minutes, we count it as an interview, and we'll charge it to the NSF I Corp. You know, uh, charge like our, our van our, our van rental and our stop at McDonald's. Okay, that, that's about you know, and, and maybe dinner. We'll probably go out to dinner, but we're heading back tonight. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank my students here. And by the way, uh, so we have Paul. And Jordan, who are both current graduate students, in our really our first group of graduating graduate students, your second year, and we have prospective graduate students, Don Natoli, um, uh, Rose Schopfer, yeah, and Frankie Wilson. Um, please talk to them, Michigan Tech people especially. Uh, I think all of them should go on to a PhD program. We don't have the PhD program right now, um, and and the undergraduates who are here, uh, you can get them for your master's program. But then you're competing with us. And so, uh, uh, but you know, I'm not worried. Uh, I'm worried. Uh, so anyway, that's I just wanted to mention and, and thank them for coming here, and they can answer questions for you uh, about uh, USA tunnels and whatever. All right, thank you very much.